episode 226. This show is intended for informational and educational purposes only. What cryptocurrency enables is new, empowering, and exciting, but we're not experts. Just obsessed companions walking the road towards a more peer-to-peer -peer future. So just about 22 months after we first heard about the uh, bit license coming out of New York, we now have a final set of rules. And so I think it's appropriate that we revisit the topic. We don't have any experts here. It's just the main host of Let's Talk Bitcoin, uh, myself, Andreas, and Stephanie. You mean we're not experts? <laughs> no, well, we're not. <laughs> I don't well, nobody's experts in this stuff. Especially the people who wrote it. This is going to be kind of one of those segments where I think that we are all opposed to it, but I think that it is to varying degrees and for varying reasons. Um, on its face, the bit license makes the assumption that if you have any user of your product that resides within the state of New York, that you should be compliant with all of New York's regulations, essentially for all of your users, which is just, again, on its face, an absolutely ridiculous assumption that totally doesn't work if that is the standard that is applied broadly. But it is the standard of the world that we happen to live in right now, and so it's worth talking about. Um, the bit license, I always thought, looking at it, looking at the way it was initially presented, was a whole bunch of ideas. Most of them were intended not to be in the final thing. They were put in as chips, and I'm not, of course, the only person who's noted this, uh, so that they could be then removed and only leave in the things that they actually really wanted in the first place. They just take out the kind of outrageous stuff. And then people would say, oh, they're so generous. Thank you so much, regulators. You, you were really nice to us. It's like when a cop threatens to, you know, charge you with a bunch of things. They pull you over and I'm um, going to give you a ticket for a broken license plate and speeding and all kinds of other stuff. And then they let you off with a warning and you end up thanking them. It's kind of one of the oldest tricks in the book, right? I think it's called uh, the art of the compromise, right? <laughs> Where, wherever you phrase that kind of initial thing. So in that, you know, when a cop pulls you over, if they've pulled you over, then they have the power at that point, really, you know, again, regardless of constitutionality or whatever, to do a lot of things to you that can, you know, they can cause problems. So that, that's sort of the, the core issue here is that the regulation causes response even when it doesn't, even when it's not being applied, even if you're not charged with something, still having it out there is just sort of this blade hanging over your neck because, well, you know, it could be applied to you even though it is. Anyways, I'm sorry, I've gotten off track here. No, I think the blade hanging over your neck is a good thing to say about this because it's not an art of compromise. There's no negotiation happening here. This is coercion coming from a government agency and they're going to apply it to you. And you really don't have much say over it. It's the power is going in one direction from them applied to you. And part of the idea behind this was, and one of the things that the proponents of this regulation lauded, was the idea that it would offer clarity, that it would bring clarity to the regulation of cryptocurrencies in the state of New York, and probably influence a lot of other regulations, bringing more clarity. So far, to me, it, it has brought clarity. It's abundantly clear that this regulation was designed to support the needs of banks and to further protect them from competition by creating an unlevel playing field where the most disruptive and competitive features of Bitcoin could be kind of polished away, where the uh, banks get a blanket exemption from any of these pesky rules, and where the cost imposed on innovation and on digital currency companies is going to be enormous to comply with these rules, while at the same time, the restrictions placed on their ability to innovate is going to be equally enormous. And so in the guise of consumer protection, it clearly, and this brings clarity, it clearly helps banks avoid competition from these digital currencies. Basically, the people of New York mean sold out by their regulators. Yeah, and we could have seen that coming. I mean, really, the average user only needs clarity if they're asking for permission, which, I don't know, to me, that was the whole point of Bitcoin, was that you didn't have to ask permission from anybody to use Bitcoin. Here are three words that are in the bit license as part of the definitions on the first page. Transmission, third party, issuance. You tell me what the hell those things mean in the context of Bitcoin, and that would have been some useful clarity. Unfortunately, one of the big problems with this regulation is that it doesn't clarify 
how these things will apply on very important issues by introducing these terms, transmission, third party, and issuer, which really mean nothing in the context of Bitcoin, that don't provide clarity, that in fact there is no transmission in Bitcoin, there is no issuer, there is no third party. Well, that third party does mean something in the context of Bitcoin. No trusted third party. It's in Satoshi's white paper. <laughs> well, here's why clarity matters. Because if you have vague regulations, then what happens is that it opens the door to selective prosecution. So basically what that means is that the vagueness creates conditions where you don't know if you're actually, first of all, subject to these regulations, so under the exemptions or not, whether the thing you're doing is subject to these regulations or not, that's not clear, uh, which means you're going to have to go and ask for permission to innovate. And then, even if you do think you're subject to this, you don't know if you're following these regulations or if you're violating them, because again, many of these things are insufficiently clear to give you that. So if it creates enough um, vague uh, regulation there, what that means is that the regulators now have the power to prosecute pretty much anyone who's playing in the digital currency space. And of course, they won't prosecute the ones that are friendly, they won't prosecute the ones that are non-threatening, they will prosecute the ones that, whose innovation threatens established interests. And so this opens up the door for highly selective prosecution based on vague interpretation of a license that offers no clarity. I'll give you one example. Under section 200.15 subparagraph J. Subparagraph J, really? <laughs> what is this? We're in the heat of it. We've well, it's got... regulations. That's what it is. It's regulation. That that's I mean, it's just a whole lot of words that have, you know, meanings that can be interpreted differently based on how specifically it's worded and it's not again in many places where it's important. The wording is not specific because to define it is to limit its power. This isn't a surprise because this is the direction that I think all legal systems or governmental systems go in eventually. It certainly has been the direction the U.S. has been going in in my lifetime. There's so many laws out there. It's impossible for any so-called citizen to know all the laws, to be able to understand and read them. To comply with them is another impossible task. So constantly, everybody is in a state of violating some law. They just don't know exactly what it is or why they're violating it. And then they say ignorance of the law is no excuse when they prosecute you, which actually that phrase comes from like medieval times when the only laws were like, don't kill anybody, don't hurt anyone. <laughs> you couldn't say you were ignorant of those. But now you can because everybody's ignorant of the law. Even the people who write the laws <laughs> are largely ignorant of them. So everybody's violating something at all times. And like you said, Andreas, it's just, you know, who ends up with the target on their back? Who's going to be the one that's gone after? Because everybody can be gone after for something. And if not, they'll just make something up. This is not a bug. This is a feature. This is a source of primary power. It is a source of power for those who have the power to prosecute. It gives them immense discretion to apply selective prosecution for political reasons, for career promotion reasons, for private profit reasons, to protect interests, for all of these other reasons that have nothing to do with justice. But make no mistake, these, this vagueness and the ability to do selective prosecution and the plethora of regulations, laws, state, federal statutes, etc., etc., that you can violate on any given day, that we all violate on any given day, that give certain people the power to do very heavy-handed prosecution of some of the most ridiculous things possible is an enormous source of power, and this is not a bug, it's a feature. So, in that vein, section 200.15 subparagraph J, each licensee shall have in place appropriate policies and procedures to block or reject specific or impermissible transactions that violate federal or state laws, rules, or regulations. This is just one example. I can give you another 10, 15 examples from the bit license, where a single sentence like that opens the door for an enormous amount of latitude. First of all, federal or state laws, rules, or regulations is in itself an, an immensely broad statement. And it doesn't even say which state, right? So presumably this means New York state, but presumably is, is something that you would have to fight. Eh, maybe that's the first motion you file in your defense to, to narrow this to New York. Not necessarily the case. 
The bigger issue is block or reject specific or impermissible transactions that violate these laws, rules, and regulations. Now, here's the thing. Let's say you're a licensee and you're running some kind of exchange or business or some kind of innovation that involves digital currencies. Now, in order to run this business, you have to connect to the Bitcoin network, which means you have to run a node. And in order to run a node, that node more or less has to be a relaying node, because if you're not relaying transactions, you're not going to get much connectivity into the network. So your node will, by necessity, relay all blocks and transactions, which means that your node now, in order to connect to the peer-to-peer -peer network, because it's peer-to-peer -peer and relays all transactions, that means that you have to somehow implement policies, procedures, and practices to ensure that that node that is relaying everybody else's transactions, transactions you do not originate, are in compliance with these applicable regulations, including regulations about blocked destinations, such as OFAC, san sanctions countries, and sanctioned accounts and individuals, AML regulations as to limits above 10,000, etc., etc., all for addresses that you have no idea what the provenance or destination is. And as a result, anyone who runs a node can, out of stretch, granted, but stretch is exactly where the power comes from, out of stretch can be in violation of this clause. You can't run a relaying node that relays transactions unless you know everything about those transactions, and you can't know everything about those transactions, so you can't run a node. And if you can't run a node, you can't run a digital currency business. Or you can run it and hope that you're one of the friendlies. I hope that you are not one of the targeted ones, because they can pull this out at any time and beat you over the head with it. And this is just one example out of probably 15 clauses of the bit license that use words such as transmission to third party, which in the case of Bitcoin involves every single transaction you do because every transaction is a transmission to a third party. Well, if you're curious about how to interpret the canon of the bit license, you could always hire the Pope uh, Ben Lasky to consult for you. Didn't he start some kind of consulting firm to help you comply with this law that he wrote? Of course, which is fantastically self-serving. But again, it doesn't guarantee anything. You can receive all of the advice that you want. You can make every good faith effort to comply with this regulation. And if you annoy someone enough to make a call to the New York DFS and remind them of their upcoming election and their upcoming campaign and their generous contributions they have received in the past and their responsibility to, quote, protect the people of New York, bullshit, quote, they will turn around and put handcuffs on you. And then they're going to throw some one of these vague rules at you, and you're going to have to figure out how to spend lots of money defending yourself so you don't end up in jail for violating a rule that basically covers every possible conceivable activity. The best part of this is that the first and most important rule in this document is the one that completely exempts all existing banks, financial institutions who are licensed in the state of New York. The only silver lining I could potentially see in this is that it just shows what a farce the whole system is, that these regulations are not meant to protect anyone except the existing banks. They're not meant to, you know, keep any, any of the little people safe. You know, I remember growing up accessing the internet and finding out about uh, torrenting, you know, music sharing, file sharing online. And yeah, everybody knew it was illegal. And that, you know, these record companies could sue you or worse, you know, your home could get raided or if your grandson downloads a couple of songs on the Internet, like it happened to one grandmother, they made an example out of her for some reason. Everybody knew it was illegal and that stuff could happen, but everybody did it anyway. And Bitcoin is just going to become like that. There's going to be a whole generation of people who learn the real rules that, the, you know, What's written down on paper with these laws isn't necessarily the way that the world is going to operate and that people do illegal things all the time and they're not actually hurting anyone. They're not actually doing anything that's morally wrong. Sometimes laws are not in line with what's morally right and wrong. Well, just think about the suggested reason for this regulation. And that suggested reason is consumer protection. It's, it's protecting consumers and also the ability to enforce existing laws to, to protect against the funding of criminal activities. So the regulations are heavy with KYC, which is the Know Your Customer Regulations. Basically, what that means is that 
every single client of any one of the licensees covered by this license will have to be providing all kinds of identifying information and the licensees will have to store all of this personally identifiable information that no bank can keep secure as we've seen again and again no corporation can keep secure the federal government itself can keep secure the information about background checks on four million of its own employees for god's sake and we've seen that happen again and again and again what it does is it turns every licensee into a honeypot of personally identifiable information and all of this information is essentially vulnerable and makes every single consumer that interacts with a licensee vulnerable to identity theft and all kinds of other violations of their privacy. But the one thing that's missing from this regulation, of course, is any recognition of multi-signature technology or escrow-based technologies, technologies that dilute custodial control over funds, technologies that allow for the first time in the history of payment systems to have non-custodial minority control over funds that puts the power back in the hands of consumers. There are no exemptions if you hold only one of a three multi-sig key where the consumer is f firmly in control, which is in fact a primary means of consumer protection by returning control over both the funds and the private information to the consumer themselves so they're not subject to identity theft and they're not subject to embezzlement and hacking and theft of their funds. So. It doesn't recognize the potential for technological solutions. It makes no distinction between companies that have full custody and companies that have minority custody of these funds, which as a regulation would actually, if, if there was a carve out for that, it would actually uh, force companies or encourage companies through incentives to move towards not having custodial control over funds because they could save a lot of money on regulatory compliance. Instead, not only does it not have that, but it pushes companies in exactly the opposite direction, where they have to collect as much information as possible and become these giant honeypots of PII, personally identifiable information. And the first company to say, no, we're not going to do that to our own customers, Shapeshift.io, a decentralized exchange, or rather an exchange that doesn't require registration of accounts, it's, it's somewhat decentralized, and that allows you to exchange currencies for another, simply decided that in order to protect its own customers, it couldn't subject them to these regulations just because some of them might be in New York and it cut off everyone in New York. If you visit shapeshift.io today from a New York IP address, you will be forwarded and redirected to pleaseprotectconsumers.org. And that uh, website tells you why you are in a censored jurisdiction, why that regulation mandates the extraction of your personal private information and why it jeopardizes your safety and why the company that redirected you there refuses to do it. I hope many other companies take the lead and, uh, and do exactly that and uh, recognize that they can't do a disservice to all of their customers just because some of them are in New York. And if uh, living in New York under these regulations is a problem, at least it's a problem only from New Yorkers. Ironically enough, the other jurisdiction that does the same, which is also mentioned on this site, are the two jurisdictions that, that do this, the Democratic People's Republic of North Korea and the state of New York. What do you say? <laughs> about how there are areas of this law specifically that are particularly onerous because they're really, really vague. I came across Coin Center's kind of take at doing some of these definitions, and I wanted to kind of just see what you guys thought of the definitions for qualifying activities and non-qualifying activities relative. You know, this is what uh, Coin Center and Jerry Brito from over there is uh, suggesting would be much better definitions, not just for New York, but broadly, anybody who wants to regulate it, this is a way to, to take into account those technical uh, details that you were talking about that obviously are not accounted for in the New York law. 
So digital currency transmission, the suggested definition by coincenter.org, qualifying activities, a business shall be found to be engaged in digital currency transmission if and only if the business regularly and in the course of business has the ability to unilaterally execute or prevent a digital currency transaction on behalf of others. The key word there is unilaterally, which means custodial control over the funds. Right. So Coinbase would fall under this because Coinbase holds your keys and Coinbase can not only uh, execute on your behalf, but they can also prevent execution on your behalf. And any company that uses even a simple third-party oracle to co-sign transactions would immediately be exempt under this definition, which would and then create an enormous incentive to implement multi-signature with oracles in order to precisely avoid the burden of these regulations and which would actually push the industry in a direction that has uh, consumer protection as a design feature. Right, I agree. It seems like, again, if you were to be specific and you, you, know, you make the regulation fall on the things where you really are not only looking like a bank, but also you have the power and control that a bank does. If you, you know, take these other things where you can no longer unilaterally execute or prevent, then yeah, it just really seems like that would push people towards these more decentralized solutions that do keep the trust off of them because holding that trust would have a real cost and you would get around it by not having it. And that's not regulation of digital currency. That's regulation of banking. If what you do with the digital currency is banking, then you should be regulated under banking rules. The fact, of course, that these are not enforced is a whole other conversation we can go into. But you should be regulated for banking if you're banking. And that's not regulation of digital currency. That's regulation of banking. Stephanie, I don't know what your opinion on this is, but if Coinbase is doing banking, then they should be regulated for doing banking. And that will discourage them from doing banking, quite honestly. Multisig technology and oracles are not covered in this law yet. But of course, we all know that this is going to be a living, breathing document and it's going to be updated. So the blockchain is forever. Something can become illegal in the future, like we just said on a recent show. What's to stop them from just kind of putting in a clause that, <laughs> that says, oh yeah, multisig too? Well, right now they don't exempt multisig. So it is multisig too at the moment. It doesn't really, there's absolutely no benefits to doing multisig. In fact, if anything, there's a disadvantage. If you're doing multisig under this regulation, then every single party in the multisig has to behave as if they're a bank, even though they're not. Ah, got it. The point is it can change. As far as Coinbase goes, you know, they recently like decided they were going to cut off Wyoming. They were going to stop doing business in Wyoming. I don't know. I'm curious about that. They're probably not going to cut off New York, but why did they actually cut off Wyoming? There was a state regulation, I believe, in, in Wyoming that, that created a very difficult regulatory environment. And just, just to clarify, I'm not bashing Coinbase for the choices they made. They are very explicitly doing custodial Bitcoin. They want to do custodial Bitcoin. They think that is necessary in order to offer an exchange. And I use them on a regular basis in order to convert to fiat. But we're using them as an example primarily because they are exactly the company that should be subject to these regulations. Right, because they're a Bitcoin bank. Because they're a Bitcoin bank, exactly. So they should be subject to banking regulations. If you have custodial control over people's money, that increases the risk that you will get robbed or that you will run away with the money. And any company that's doing custodial control over Bitcoin is a bank. Okay, and then the other definition that I just want to go over real quickly, uh, also from coincenter.org in this uh, same paper, which we'll link in the show notes, non-qualifying activities, as they've defined that as well, in no event shall any of the following activities uh, in and of themselves be interpreted as digital currency transmission. One, developing, distributing, or servicing software. Two, contributing software, connectivity, or computing power to a decentralized uh, digital currency providing data storage or security services for a digital currency business, or four, engaging in otherwise qualifying activities undertaken for non-financial purposes, or that do not include more than a nominal amount of digital currency. What is a nominal amount? Last one is the same exemption that is in the bit license. So uh, within the bit license, there's an exemption for any non-financial, any transactions that are predominantly non-financial that include the transmission let me quote the whole thing. Receiving virtual currency for transmission or transmitting virtual currency except where the transaction is undertaken for non-financial purposes and does not involve the transfer of more than a nominal amount of virtual currency. I think the, the word nominal obviously is, is way too vague, but most likely what that would mean 
is where the value of the transaction is not in the amount of currency that is being transmitted, but in the metadata that it carries, meaning colored coins, tokens, assets, document registration, etc., etc. All of those uses for which you spend a few satoshis in order to record something into the blockchain, and the primary purpose of the transaction is not the currency value itself. But of course, again, that's, that's vague, and, and that's problematic. Another interesting use case that's kind of come up in all of this is that the problem of currency has to do with it floating in value against the dollar. There are some interesting uh, ideas around phrasing tokens as uh, gift certificates and coupons, which have a different, very much reduced regulatory regime, and where most of the requirements there have to do with expiration dates and service fees and things that really don't come into play when you're talking about cryptographic tokens. For example, there are no exemptions in the bid license for LTB coin. So even though the stuff that I'm doing... Uh, yes, they are. There, there are? Digital units that can be redeemed for goods, services, discounts, or purchases as part of a customer affinity or rewards program with the issuer and or other designated merchants, or can be redeemed for digital units in another customer affinity or rewards program, but cannot be converted into or redeemed for fiat currency or virtual currency. Right, but there's Didn't a catch you there. read it, Adam? Ignorance of but the no, law I, is I no actually, excuse. Uh, I actually did read that, and uh, and there's a catch. The catch is that it has to have a fixed denominated value at that merchant. So LTB coin doesn't have that. LTB coin, we historically have had prices that float based on the market value of LTB coin at one of the markets that independently chose to trade it. And so then we base our prices relative to that. So we have fixed prices and then we discount. So so as it stands right now, LTB coin sort of is, is, a, is a gray area, but that's exactly what I was getting to is that if we then were to say, okay, well, LTB coin represents one penny per LTB coin redeemable value at, at our store and affiliated merchants, then yes, you're right. Then it stops being a community currency, which is what I've classified it to this point, you know, uh, given out through a rewards program and starts being, you know, this uh, coupon or gift certificate or redeemable thing. And I think that that's true of many, many types of tokens out there. You know, you can't do it with Bitcoin, but most things you can. I love this other part of the regulation in Bit license, which is hilarious, which just precedes this. And it says basically, digital units that are used solely within online gaming platforms have no market or application outside of those gaming platforms and cannot be converted into or redeemed for fiat currency or virtual currency and may or may not be redeemable for real world goods, services, discounts, or purposes. I love that. I love that definition because if someone could create a digital unit that has value within an online gaming platform or within any context, but at the same time has no market or application outside of that context, they would probably win a Nobel Prize in economics because so far nobody has figured out how to make a secondary market not exist. And this is hilarious because this is basically a statement requiring these digital units to break a fundamental law of economics, which no digital unit has ever broken the moment you have an in-game currency, a reward point, a value system, any kind of digital unit that has value in one context. It immediately acquires secondary market value in a thousand other contexts, whether you allow it or not. That is basic economics. Markets will be created to trade value for value, like for like, in purposes other than the originally designed purposes. And if you could actually design such a digital unit, it would be an, an incredible invention. No one has done it so far. So, so this is hilarious because they're, they're basically describing a unicorn. And they're saying that the unicorn is exempt. Well, great. Fantastic. Let's go find one. Today's magic word is rules. That's R-U-L-E-S. Rules. You've got until the 7th of July to visit letstalkbitcoin.com or the Let's Talk Bitcoin iOS app to enter it for your share of the listener rewards.
I want to play devil's advocate here a little bit because my perspective on this is a little different perhaps because I have been in the process for the last six months now of starting a company that's building tools that kind of operate for non-currency uses of Bitcoin. And so I've been pretty concerned about what was going to come out of this New York rules finding because we don't really want to be, have to do any of those things. We don't think that the things that we're doing really constitute money transmitting and in a traditional sense, they don't seem to. It doesn't matter what you think. It matters what they think. Right. That's true. But it's important to note that they have specified. OK, there are a couple of things here. First off, they're not regulating Bitcoin. They're regulating Bitcoin companies. So just like uh, Shapeshift did, companies that find that they will have to comply with these regulations and have to register but don't want to do that simply can decide to just exempt New York. It's not a great solution. It's something we've, again, looked at doing ourselves with LTB coin. We have people in New York who we really don't want to exclude. And so it's it's a very difficult decision, not just for us, but I think for everybody. Well, they're not regulating Bitcoin. They're regulating Bitcoin companies. Do you think that's because they don't want to regulate Bitcoin or because they can't regulate Bitcoin? Because they can't regulate anything but companies. That's what they have the ability to regulate. People can be put in jail. Companies can be fined. They're legal entities that you know are suable as opposed to the technology, which obviously simply is beyond their reach. But if they could, they would. Of course. Okay. Yeah, no, uh, there's no question about that. It, you know, again, I'm not saying that any of this stuff is intended to help anything. I'm saying that this is inevitable. Of course, they're going to do it. They're going to try and get as much as they can. So let's see what happened and let's, you know, figure this out. Um, one thing that strikes me is that banks are exempted, yes, but all of the regulations and all of the rulemaking that they seem to have, you know, put out seems to mostly mirror what banks already do. And actually, in some circumstances, the requirements are substantially less onerous than banks are already complying with. So I understand that, yes, obviously, we'd like it if these rules applied to everybody. But you will be able to take a license from another state or from a federal jurisdiction and use that to satisfy the New York condition. So it's not like they're just adding layer on layer for no reason. What they're doing is they're filling in what they perceive to be a gap in the regulatory net. As we've said before, if it looks like a duck and it you know quacks like a duck, then it probably is going to get treated like a duck. That's not carved out. It's not just the companies that provide banking services. In fact, the exemptions, as they are written, are vague enough that it can catch a lot more people than banking service. I can read you some more clauses if you want that. You know, there's, there's things like, for example, if you're located in New York, even if you're not a resident, so that means people traveling through New York may be under this. It's, it has carve-outs for merchants and consumers, but it doesn't actually specify what either of those are. So uh, is a professional service that is not offering goods a merchant, or is it not a merchant? There's all kinds of vagueness in here that means that if the net is cast really wide and the prosecution is really malicious, then they can quite easily wrap a lot of people in it. Don't disagree with that at all. I'm just saying that, again, relative to some of the other examples that we've seen put on the table, this was not as bad as it could have been. You look at California, for example, and what they've been talking about doing there Paper is not something that is controlled in our world. You can go out and buy paper. There's no licensing requirement or whatever. If you are someone who writes doctor scripts and you have a doctor script, then that is controlled because using a doctor script assigned doctors a note, you can essentially get access to drugs which are uh, regulated and thus there needs to be this regulatory action. Just don't write it on hemp paper. <laughs> New York has basically I mean, taken the position. I mean, controlled, Adam. You know? Right, right. That's fine. That's fine. But my point is, is that New York's position on this is basically that if it looks like a doctor's note, we're going to regulate it like a doctor's note. It doesn't matter what it's, what it's written on, whatever. Whereas California, what they've been doing is saying, well, doctor's notes are written on paper. So if you use paper for anything, then you need to have a license and, and get our approval. Those two situations compared to each other, again, like both of them, it'd be better if, if state governments and the federal government and everybody just completely left the thing alone because it's not something that they really have jurisdiction over. But given that it doesn't seem like that's very likely, I prefer the New York approach that has more specificity to it and that puts the burden onto companies that are actually doing bank like services as opposed to putting it on to literally anybody who's using, you know, who's using a token for anything, anybody who uses cryptocurrency or decentralized you know, a distributed computing network for anything, which is, again, what California has been. That's what their wording basically says. So basically what you're saying is, if you allow me to paraphrase with an analogy just a tiny bit, 
it was an open hand slap and not a closed fist punch. And he said he was sorry. And after all, it's probably your fault because you burned his dinner anyway. Exactly. I, I was going <laughs> to say something very similar, Andreas. Like both of these things are unacceptable. Like I, I hate getting into these conversations. It's the same thing with politics and voting. Oh, which horrible candidate is slightly better? Which is the lesser of two evils? No, they're both evil and evil is not a necessity. Regulation written without any understanding of the thing that they're regulating, which is abundantly clear from this regulation. The primary problem I have with this is not the fact that it's written by banks for banks and for the benefit of banks. It's that it's written with a reckless disregard for how the thing actually works and a complete lack of understanding of any of the nuances of digital currencies. And in a way that is, is a clear throwback to things like the Locomotive Act and the Red Flag Act and so many other failed regulations written by the incumbents to stifle competition in an emerging disruptive industry that's going to eat their lunch. What is the Red Flag Act? I think that's actually worth saying on the show. So the Red Flag Act is a series of laws passed in England in 1896 that, that regulated the use of automobiles on the streets. And they were written essentially by the locomotive lobby, they treated cars like trains. And so they, were, they had these absurd regulations that required certain types of cars to be operated with an engineer and an operator. And one of the rules was that if, the, if a car had a certain length, it had to be preceded by a flagman who ran ahead, waving a red flag to warn pedestrians that this infernal machine was coming behind. It's a prime example. We've seen this again and again of the incumbents writing a regulation about how these things should work. And I, I've had people ask me sometimes, you know, well, why do you hate regulation? Regulation is good. I mean, look at the FAA. They protect you and, and keep flying safe. And it's like, well, yes, but if you look at the history of aviation, the FAA wasn't created in the beginning and it wasn't creating by the shipbuilding industry. Otherwise, every time you got on a, on a plane, it would have to have lifeboats hanging off the sides. <laughs> And stuff like that. And they, if it was regulated by the, by the ship industry, they'd have to ensure that every plane had a ballroom and a warm buffet for its customers. This is basically regulation written by the incumbents to stifle innovation in a new industry, in a new technology that they barely understand. They understand the least of it, and they really don't understand the most important aspects of it, which are the ones that deliver consumer protection as a tangible result of technology rather than as a secondary effect of heavily onerous regulation like KYC and AML. What actually happened with the Red Flag Act? Was it eventually nullified or did people just ignore it so much that it became irrelevant? I know the history of Skype, you know, what happened when they were sort of threatened to be regulated as a as though they were a phone company and they had to have long distance and things like that. And they just said, no, we're not a phone company and we are not going to be regulated like one. That's totally not what we are. And they were pretty much successful with that. But they had the mindset of, hey, you know, we don't want to be subject to these things. This is kind of ridiculous. Whereas within the Bitcoin community, there actually are a lot of people asking for begging, getting down on their knees to be regulated and to have clarity and to give me permission and to protect me from competition, those other upstarts. Um, so I think the attitude within an industry really matters in that. I think it might be too late for Bitcoin because there are so many people begging for regulation and they have been for a while. I mean, I'm just curious, Andres, what, what actually happened with the Red Flag Act in that situation? The three things happened. The first thing that happened was that in the late 19th century, in the 1890s, if you like, Britain was far ahead in terms of automotive development. And by the beginning of the 20th century, the United States and Germany had taken over as the leaders in that industry. And the owner's regulation by steam engine companies and locomotive companies and various other incumbents well, one of the reasons I think many uh, believe that the automotive industry in England ended up playing second fiddle to other industries, even though it was ahead. If you remember, at the time, this was, you know, the industrial power in this world, the first to really harness the steam engine and, and, and create an industrial revolution. And they lost the automotive race and they lost it uh, through regulation written by incumbents. The second thing that happened is a lot of these things got repealed. 
But the third thing that happened is a lot of these things simply got ignored. Just as a little reference, today in one of the municipalities in London, every carriage, which is defined uh, to include automobiles, has to have a hay bag and a poop bag hanging off the front and back of it, respectively. I have been in English taxis in that municipality, and I can assure you they have neither a hay bag nor a poop bag hanging off the back, so I'm assuming that they're ignoring these regulations. But on the statutes, you can be prosecuted for such reckless use of a horseless carriage. So I have a question. Given that, obviously, this is all as unacceptable as it could possibly be, and given that we live in the world that we do right now that happens to be in the state that it is right now, what is the course of action? Well, I mean, to Stephanie's point, I think this is not like the Bitcoin industry has been asking for it and we have no way out. I think what, what you're seeing is some parts of the Bitcoin industry, clearly ones that are trying desperately to recreate the banking environments, that are effectively trying to use digital currencies to get banking licenses on the cheap, for the very simple reason that a banking license is simultaneously a license to print money and a license to steal without getting punished. They're trying to replicate these environments. They're trying to cozy up to the regulators, and they think that if they become part of that clique, they can then essentially achieve immunity from prosecution for any and all financial crimes that they ever do. Who wouldn't want to be part of that party? It's very lucrative. It's one of the few remaining industries in the United States that's making any money right now because they're, quote, making money. Exactly. And so that's going to essentially just relegate them to the backwaters of innovation in the industry. They will not be able to adopt the new things because each time they try to change something, by the way, one of the other pernicious aspects of the bit license is that it requires you to receive permission if you make any material changes to your infrastructure. And so they're not going to be able to adopt innovations. And these innovations are coming at a frenetic pace from the rest of the Bitcoin industry. That's kind of like the post office, huh? Right. You have to get approval it's, every time it's they ridiculous. change something. So, so are they going to be able to implement, um, you know, the latest and greatest in multi-sig and micropayments and payment channels and uh, transaction confidentiality, the, the stuff that's coming out of some of the sidechains teams, threshold signatures, Schnorr algorithm, all of the other really, really exciting innovation. I mean, there's so much amazing stuff happening in Bitcoin, and all of that is going to happen outside of New York now, guaranteed. You cannot run the latest, greatest things, and, and not just outside of New York, but with complete exclusion of New York customers, because that will be the choice. The choice will be either to slow down the innovation, uh, ask permission for everything, and spend a lot of money trying to comply, or simply cut off New York customers from your systems. And so we're going to see, I think, a lot of companies following the lead of Shapeshift, cutting off New York customers and creating more innovative systems. And that's great because you know what? There's lots of people out there in the world who don't know anything about banking, have never been subjected to this bullshit, don't need it, and can go directly from being pre-banked to being debanked and unbanked and remain so and use digital currencies as a leapfrog technology. And they won't give a damn what Lasky thinks and what strange regulation they're passing in New York. New York is going to be a backwater of digital currency innovation. And I think that's only fitting because it now represents the blockbuster side of the financial industry, the tower record side of the financial industry, the Kodak side of the financial industry. And they can tell us about the timeless quality of traditional banking institutions while we move on and innovate. Thanks for listening to this episode of Let's Talk Bitcoin. Content for today's show is provided by Stephanie, Andreas, and Adam. Music for this episode is provided by Jared Rubens and Murkowski. This episode was edited by Adam B. Levine. Thanks for listening. English, Espanol. Video mix number 25, video mix numero 25. This time I want to talk especially about hashtag 
JCCVW, which I created some time ago, abbreviation for Justice, Court, Comedy and Virtual Worlds. Esta vez quiero hablar especialmente sobre el tema hashtag JCCVW que el hashtag que he creado hace algún tiempo so, que, eh, y es la abreviación por eh, justicia, Justice Court Comedy in Virtual Worlds, eh, justicia, comedia de justicia en mundos virtuales. I made already several videos about this hashtag. Uh, ya he hecho varios videos sobre este hashtag video. But this time, especially thinking of my last video, number 24, uh, Robot Ethics. Pero esta vez, especialmente pensando en mi último video, uh, video mix número 24, Robot Ethics, e Ética de Robots. First, I want to mention uh, the episode of Simpsons, Treehouse of Horror, number 13. Primero quiero men mencionar el, el, epi el episodio de Simpsons número 13, Treehouse of Horror. Número 13. Just a side note, it's uh, astonishing uh, now many years in Spanish TV uh, and at lunchtime and in the evening they are still showing about half an hour or more uh, Simpsons, many years now. Uh, it's asombroso. Um, ya muchos años que por el mediodía y también por la, por la noche enseñan por lo menos media hora de los Simpsons en la televisión española. Did you hear of the term Simpsonology? Has oído de, del término Simpsonología o Simpson, Simpson, Simpsonology? Simpson? Simpsonology. Maybe I'll check out if it in Spanish. Simpsonología. Todavía. Long story short, the moral of the, this episode of The Simpsons. The animals have more ethics than humans. Resumiendo este episodio de Los Simpsons, uh, los animales tienen más ética que los humanos. Remember my last video number, video mix number 24, Robot Ethics, Cat Ethics. Recuerda mi uh, último video mix número 24, Robot Ethics, Ética de Robots and Cat Ethics, Ética de Gatos. And with a funny gif, GIF is abbreviation for Graphic Interchange Format. Y con un gracioso gif, GIF. Maybe it's a little bit helpful to compare robot ethics and cat ethics. Tal vez uh, ayuda a comparar un poco el ética de robots y ética de gatos. Once I said to my mom, uh, talking with this person is like uh, teaching, teaching ethics to cats. Una vez he dicho a mi madre, mira, hablando con esa persona es como eh, enseñar ética a, a gatos. They just do what they want. Solo simp simplemente hacen lo que quieren. And the robots do what they are programmed to do. 
y los robots hacen simplemente lo que están programados de hacer. The question is the responsibility. La cuestión es la responsabilidad. So in the end, you see, it's almost not controllable. Así que verás que al final no es controlable. But normal cats can never turn as evil as humans. Pero gatos normales nunca pueden volverse tan eh, malos, hacer cosas tan malas como los humanos. Perversion, perversión, opposite land, el país de justo todo al revés. Copyright, copy prohibition. El copyright es más bien no un derecho de copiar, sino una prohibición de copiar. copiar. Law of intellectual property. La ley de la propiedad intelectual. Especially because I like to produce video mix, I got very angry about the legal system and the perverse law of intellectual property which inhibits innovation and freedom of expression. Especialmente porque me gusta producir video mix, uh, me enfadé con el sistema legal, en especialmente, el, especialmente la ley de la propiedad intelectual que inhibe la innovación y la libertad de expresión. And if you continue to think about the legal system, uh, you get more and more doubts. Y si continuas de pensar sobre el sistema legal, vas a tener más y más dudas. But still, you have, I think it's important to have a place to talk about ethics. Pero igualmente pienso que es importante de tener un lugar donde se hable sobre ética. That's the main motivation why I created hashtag JCCVW, Justice Card Comedy and Virtual Worlds. Es la motivación principal por la que creado el hashtag JCCVW, Just, Justice Court Comedy in Virtual Worlds, Justicia, Comedia de Justicia en Mundos Virtuales. Even on my main Twitter account, Manos Enigma, the cover picture, uh, I've got written Justice, who has the right to judge? Who is without sin cast the first stone? Hasta en mi cuenta de Twitter principal, Vanos Enigma, tengo um, a cover, um, la imagen de cover, escrito justicia. ¿Quién tiene el derecho de juzgar? ¿Quién está sin pecado que tire la primera piedra? And it's astonishing how often the Simpsons show some kind of court comedies. Y es asombroso cuántas veces en los Simpsons enseñan algún tipo de comedias de juicios. I want to remember especially the lawsuit or court comedy of Homer Simpson when he sold his soul to the devil, Ned Flanders. 
especialmente quiero recordar el juicio de Homer Simpson cuando vendió su alma al diablo uh, Ned Flanders en nuestro legal system la pregunta es siempre es es legal o es ilegal en el sistema legal eh, normalmente la, pues, la pregunta es es legal o es ilegal but es more important to ask is it, is it ethical is it right or is it wrong es más importante preguntar es está bien o mal es ético o es, no no es ético Did you hear of the term jury nullification? Has oído de este término ahora no sé en español, pero eh, uno tiene el derecho de decir que, por ejemplo, no culpable porque la ley es injusta. You have the right to say it's uh, not guilty because the law is not just in just I want to remember especially the case of Ross Albrecht Free Ross hashtag Free Ross Dread Pirate Silk Road especialmente quiero recordar el juicio de Ross Albrecht um, Silk Road Bitcoin and my profile picture of Innocent Crypto Kitty y mi imagen de perfil Innocent Crypto Kitty que quiere decir el, el gatito inocente de criptografía but it's medical catnip pero es catnip médico 30 years of jail for running a website which other people used for buying and selling catnip. 30 años de cárcel por hacer una página web que otras personas han usado para comprar y vender catnip. And I want to remember what uh, said Roger Ware, uh, Bitcoin Jesus. He said something like, uh, the war against drugs cause more harm than the drugs themselves. Y quiero recordar lo que dijo Roger Ware, que es como el Bitcoin, el Jesús de Bitcoin, Dijo algo como que la guerra contra las drogas causan más daño que las drogas mismas. Okay, let's go back to even if you would have want to have a person like ah and not just Roger Ware uh, the case of Charlie Shrim, another Bitcoiner. A very interesting case too and one interview um, I made a video um, very interesting comment of Andreas Antonopoulos in one episode of Let's Talk Bitcoin I think it's the video mix number Yes, I had just a look. It's video mix number 17. Posto en mirado es el video mix número 17 con Charlie Shrem. This comment I like too much, so I will paste it. Pasted here. Este comentario me gusta demasiado, así que uh, algunos minutos voy a pegar en este momento. And, uh, podcast can agree to the fact that. 
whatever we have in this country that passes for a justice system has at least three tiers. There are, you know, people at the top who get infinite, infinite forgiveness for some of the most disgusting mega crimes and never face the tiniest consequence for their actions. You can put a million people out of their homes with fraudulent foreclosures. And you'll never see the inside of a courtroom. You can rig markets, steal money from investors, defraud millions of people. You'll never see the inside of a courtroom. And yet there's the other side of the scale where you have a situation of zero tolerance where the slightest infraction selling a loose cigarette for 30 cents gets you a street side arrest judgment and execution by strangulation where jaywalking gets you shot by a cop even if you're unarmed and where cities run effectively debtors prisons where they rotate people through there for traffic fines and keep accumulating them until they end up in jail for violating subpoenas and things like that and run it as a for-profit enterprise. And then in the middle is the middle class caught in this justice system, this thin layer that's getting thinner all the time because they're getting squeezed from the bottom. And the middle class sees the top of this country getting away with uh, mega crimes and sees a wave of zero tolerance coming at them that used to only affect minorities, but now is increasingly taking bites out of the middle class. And they're struggling desperately not to fall into this Orwellian zero tolerance justice system. That's not justice. I think everyone on this call probably has a similar perspective to this, but effectively what we're talking about is an erosion of the rule of law. And the most fundamental concept of the rule of law is equality in judgment. If a law exists, there is one tier. Everybody faces the same consequences for breaking that law. And that fundamental social compact has been violated. And for some stratum of the society, it never really existed. You know, some people were always going to feel the heavy boot of law um, with no recourse and um, suffered under that for 200 years. Uh, but now that is increasingly becoming the vast majority of the population. So you live in a society where the slightest mistake is very harshly punished. That's if you survive the police encounter. Um, while you watch a country's so-called elite just roll from scandal to scandal, from crime to crime with no one going to jail. War crimes, no jail time bank fraud, no jail time. All of these things, you know, surveillance and violating the constitutional rights of millions of people, not even a misdemeanor issue. It just gets legalized after the fact. Lying to Congress, no problem. And then Preet can promote his resume by going after Charlie. It's really a disgusting situation, but I think it's it's a situation that has nothing to do with Bitcoin per se is just a universal collapse of justice and the rule of law in this country. One of the few countries that actually had it. As that was so well said, I have no response to it. I, I completely agree with Andreas, everything he just said. It's 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 not limited to, to Bitcoin. It's a, it's an overall you see it you see it with everything. I mean look at the case of Aaron Schwartz. May he rest in peace, but once they have their sights on you it's you per se i think it's what you represent or who you are um there's no getting out of those sites and the higher up you are the harder it is for them to prosecute you it just doesn't make sense for them our justice system has been corrupted or viewed to, to, to what it is today and I created the hashtag Let's Talk Justice, or maybe a better 
hashtag let's talk ethics y también he creado ese hashtag uh, vamos a hablar sobre justicia let's talk uh, justice pero tal vez mejor uh, let's talk ethics uh, vamos a hablar sobre ética After this part of video mix number 17, I will paste a short video comparison of the two uh, websites of Wikipedia about this episode of Simpson Treehouse of Horror number 13. Y después de esa parte del video mix número 17 voy a pegar un pequeño video en una comparación entre las dos páginas de Wikipedia en inglés, en español. I forgot to say in English, in comparison between English and Spanish of the episode of the Simpsons Treehouse of Horror no, eh, perdón, español ahora eh, comparación del episodio de Simpsons Treehouse of Horror número 13 comparing hashtag JCCVW to uh, the real legal system of course there is no such thing like judgment, rather a uh, fiction punishment. Comparando JCCVW, uh, comparándolo con el sistema legal, uh, por supuesto no hay tal cosa como un, una sentencia de juicio más bien un, un castigo ficticio. Just want to remember you, I have that uh, Twitter account Soul Trade Game in virtual worlds like Second Life with, with Virtual Guide Dog. Uh, recordar que tengo la cuenta en Twitter que se llama Soul Trade Game traducido juego de negocios de almas es como un juego en mundos virtuales como Second Life especially interesting for cats and blind people especialmente interesante para gatos y personas que estén ciegos o tengan problemas con los ojos o people blind or people who have problems with the eyes. Anyway, watch my videos about Soul Trade Game. De toda forma mirad mis videos sobre Soul Trade Game, juego de negocio de almas. And I have that Twitter account, Soul, uh, sorry, Soul Confiscator Catch. Y tengo este, esta cuenta de Twitter, Soul Confiscator Cat. You are welcome on all of my Twitter accounts. Normally I follow back. Estáis bienvenidos en todas mis cuentas de Twitter. Normalmente sigo de vuelta. So you see, I have a double or triple interest to open hashtag JCCVW. Así que veis que tengo un doble o triple interés de abrir el hashtag JCCVW, Justice Court Comedy in Virtual Worlds. Uh, what I wanted to say before about the jury nullification. Uh, if you really would like to to um, participate in a trial lawsuit uh, to help 
uh, somebody from getting declared guilty fast. You have to take vacation. You have to buy a flight to New York. And I think this trial was in January of um, Free Ross, Ross Albrecht, um, Silk Road. So, bueno, lo que iba a decir antes uh, con respecto al derecho de uh, renalification en español, no me acuerdo, no estoy segura, pero que tienes el derecho de decir que mira, yo estoy, uh, no estoy de acuerdo que esta persona sea declarada culpable. Oh, así que primero tendrías que tomar vacaciones, comprar un vuelo a Nueva York y eh, era ese juicio me parece era en, en enero cuando hizo un montón de frío. So comparing this legal system with uh, hashtag JCCVW, this is in, in, in virtual worlds. Everybody can participate and talk about ethics, right or wrong don't need to buy a flight to New York, uh, comparando ahí con el sistema legal. No, eso tiene que, tiene lugar en mundos virtuales, no hay que comprar un vuelo a Nueva York y tanto, tanto esfuerzo para participar en un juicio, discutir sobre ética, Puedes fácilmente participar de cualquier lugar, ordenador, P2P, and especially talking about robot ethics, this will be very important in the future. Y especialmente el tema de ética de robots en el futuro será muy importante. Because it's easy to say that the person who programmed the robot is responsible for the actions, but uh, it's very easy to uh, to hide the identity who programmed the robot. Es muy fácil decir que la persona que ha programado el robot es responsable por las acciones del robot, pero es muy fácil de ocultar la identidad de la persona que ha programado el robot. So now I'll paste these, these two videos. Así que ahora voy a pegar estos dos videos. Español, English, Deutsch. Normalmente produzco solo videos en inglés y español. Normally I produce only videos in English and Spanish. Normalerweise produziere ich nur videos in English and Spanish. Pero hoy voy a hacer otra excepción y traducirlo también en alemán. But today I make another exception and translate it into German too. Aber heute werde ich nochmal eine Ausnahme machen und es auch in Deutsch übersetzen. Ja, algunas semanas tengo escrito en mi lista de tareas por hacer de traducir el video hashtag BTC4. Now, already some weeks ago, I have written on my to-do list to translate the video BTC4, hashtag BTC4. Schon seit ein paar Wochen habe ich uh, auf meiner to-do list geschrieben, um, den Video BTC4 in Deutsch zu übersetzen. Estoy segura que esta idea puede ayudar a mucha gente económicamente. I am sure that this can help many people economically. Ich bin sicher, dass diese Idee vielen Leuten 
äh, finanziell helfen kann. Y da motivación para aprender Bitcoin. And give motivation to learn about Bitcoin. Und motivation geben, um über Bitcoin zu lernen. En este momento el precio de Bitcoin es muy bajo, económico. At the moment the price of Bitcoin is very low, economic. Im Moment ist der Preis von Bitcoin sehr tief. Sería el momento ideal para invertir. Hoy es el 15 de abril 2015. Would be the ideal moment to invest. Today is April 15th, 2015. Es wäre der ideale Moment zu investieren. Heute ist der 15. April 2015. El 27 de marzo 2015 he publicado en mi canal de YouTube Vanos Enigma el primer video sobre hashtag BTC4 explicando cómo me vino esta idea. On March 27th of 2015, um, I published my for the first video about hashtag BTC4 in my channel YouTube Vanos Enigma, explaining how I got the idea. Am 27. März 2015 habe ich in meinem YouTube-Channel Vanos Enigma den ersten, den ersten Video über Hashtag BTC4 veröffentlicht und äh, erzählt, erklärt, wie ich diese Idee bekommen habe. La idea consiste principalmente en lo siguiente. The idea mainly consists in the following. Die idea besteht hauptsächlich en folgenden, folgendem. Imprimir en direcciones de Bitcoin en papel. Diez o mínimo diez o mejor cien. To print Bitcoin directions in paper, at least 10 or better 100. Bitcoin adressen in Papier ausdrucken, um, minimum 10 or besser gleich 100. Y luego poner en cada dirección de Bitcoin una pequeña cantidad de Bitcoin. And then put in every Bitcoin direction a little amount of Bitcoin. Und dann in jede Bitcoin Adresse eine kleine Summe von Bitcoin transferieren. Y la próxima vez, cuando otra vez ves una persona por la calle pidiendo dinero, and the next time uh, you see again a person begging for money on the street. Und das nächste Mal, wenn du wieder eine Person auf der Straße betteln siehst. Y para tus amigos y amigas. And for your friends, of course. Und für deine Freunde natürlich. O tal vez eh, de propina en un restaurante. O maybe a tip in a restaurant. O da trinkgeld en restaurant. Bueno, a la hora de imprimir también copiar y guardar las llaves privadas de Bitcoin. De direcciones de Bitcoin. 
when you print the Bitcoin addresses, um, copy and save the private keys of the Bitcoin addresses, of course. Wenn man die Bitcoin Adressen druckt, auch die äh, auch die privaten Schlüssel, Bitcoin Address Schlüsseln ähm, kopieren und speichern. Y a la hora de distribuir las direcciones de Bitcoin, escribir la fecha, por ejemplo, hoy es el 15 de abril 2015, escribir la fecha, más plus cuatro años, eh, igual 15 de abril 2019. And then in the moment when you distribute uh, the Bitcoin addresses, you write the date, for example, today, April 15th, 2015, plus, plus four years uh, is April 15th, 2019. Und dann in dem Moment, wenn man die Bitcoin-Adressen verteilt, auf das Papier schreiben, das heutige Datum, zum Beispiel 15. April 2015, plus vier Jahre ist gleich 15.04.2019. Luego vas a explicar a la gente, mira, esta es la llave privada. Tú y yo la tengo, la tienes. Si no quitas, transfieres este dinero de Bitcoin eh, en estos cuatro años, yo lo vuelvo a tener. Tener o sacar. Then you explain to the people, look, this is the private key. I have it and you have it. If you don't take this money, Bitcoin, out of this account, I will take it out in this, um, in these four years, at the end of these four years. Und dann erklärst du den Leuten, schau, das ist der private Schlüssel. Um, ich und du haben diesen privaten Schlüssel, Bitcoin Schlüssel. Wenn du äh, bis Ende dieser vier Jahre das Geld Bitcoin nicht raus tust, Transfer, äh, dann hole ich es zurück. De esta forma das más motivación a la gente para empezar a aprender cómo funciona Bitcoin. This way, you give more motivation to the people to learn how the technology of Bitcoin functions. Auf diese Weise gibst du mehr Motivation den Leuten zu lernen, wie die Technologie von Bitcoin funktioniert. En mi video antiguo he explicado eh, cómo he tomado la decisión de los cuatro años. In my old video, I explained how I made the decision for the four years. In meinem original video habe ich erklärt, wie ich zu die Entscheidung getroffen habe uh, mit den vier Jahren. A continuación voy a pegar este video. Now, later, I will paste this video. Im Anschluss werde ich diesen Video ankleben. En este momento el precio de Bitcoin es muy económico. Uh, at the moment the price of Bitcoin is very cheap. Pero casi todo el mundo tiene 
muy poco dinero para invertir. But almost everybody has very little money to invest. Debería decir que esta idea me vino hoy especialmente cuando vi otra vez una chica ahí pidiendo dinero por la calle. Actually, I must say first this idea today I got especially when I saw again um, one girl begging for money in the streets. Me gustaría ayudar, pero yo tampoco me sobra mucho el dinero. I would really like to help everybody, but I, I don't have either too much money. And así que me vino la siguiente idea. So I got the following idea. It's, uh, it's más bien un juego. Uh, it's a rather a game. Um, lo que es muy importante elegir un monedero de Bitcoin que solo tú mismo misma, tienes la llave privada. What is very important uh, to choose um, Bitcoin wallet a company which you only possess the private key. For example, uh, blockchain.info. Por ejemplo, la empresa blockchain.info. Luego imprimir en papel um, la llave privada y también guardarlo tú mismo. Then to print in paper the private key and uh, of course save for, for yourself that private key. Bueno, ya estamos imprimiendo, imprime por lo menos 10. So now we are already printing, so at least print 10 directions, 10 direcciones. Luego pones algo de Bitcoin, una cantidad, lo que, lo que te da la gana en esta dirección. Then you put some Bitcoin, uh, the amount, whatever you want in, that, in these directions. Y la próxima vez que sales de casa ya tienes algo que dar a los que están ahí pidiendo por la calle. And the next time you go out of the house, you have already something to give for these people who are begging on the streets. Y por ejemplo, y claro, para tus amigos, amigas, and for your friends, of course. Eso da motivación a la gente para aprender Bitcoin y... Uh, this gives motivation for the people to learn about Bitcoin. Y la parte del juego consiste en lo siguiente. And the game part uh, consists in the following. Explicas a la gente, mira, esta es la cl clave privada, que es la clave secreta. You explain to the people, look, this is the private key, which must be secret. And uh, you have it and uh, me. And uh, explica, esa persona y yo mismo la tiene. Y antes pensaba en cinco años, pero luego cambié un poco de idea de hasta cuatro años. First, I thought of five years, but then I changed uh, my opinion to four years. Later, explain. Después, lo expli explico por qué. Les dices, mira, tienes cuatro años para poner esta cantidad de Bitcoin a otra dirección. Si no lo, lo has quitado después de cuatro años, yo lo quito. So you explain them, you have four years 
to take these Bitcoin out of this direction, of this secret uh, key direction. If uh, you don't do it, uh, I do it after these four years. So you lose this. That's the, this part of the game. as uh, la parte del juego. He creado este hashtag uh, BTC4 para hacerlo un poco popular. I created this hashtag BTC4 to make it a little popular. Antes pensaba en cinco años, pero luego cambié a cuatro porque te has dado cuenta que en los Simpsons eh, la gente tiene cuatro dedos y solo do, Dios tiene cinco dedos. Um, first, I thought of five years, but then I changed my mind to four years. Um, did you notice that in the Simpsons? People have a four fingers and only God has five fingers. Uh, I'll show some pictures. Voy a enseñar algunas imágenes de los Simpsons. De los manos y dedos de Simpsons. Some pictures of the hands and fingers of Simpsons. Uh, pero antes quiero recordar que Um, es muy probable que en también cuatro o cinco en los próximos años el valor de Bitcoin puede subir mucho. Just want to remember before that uh, the price of Bitcoin, the value of Bitcoin can rise very much in these next years. Así que si solo pones una cantidad pequeña, más tarde puede ser de gran ayuda. Even if you just put a little small amount, later it can be big help. Uh, no solo para... Bueno, es un juego. <laughs> Si la persona lo quita antes de cuatro años, para, es para esta persona. Si no, es para ti. Si te recuerdas y guardas bien la llave privada. So, uh, it's, this is the game part. If uh, the, the person takes the money out, it's for that person. But if they forget it after these four years, you can take it out. And it can be really... <laughs> Bueno, imprimir también la llave pública y la llave privada. Y si, por ejemplo, ok, first translate. Print not just the private key, but on also the public key. Así que si, por ejemplo, explicas a la gente. Mira, si alguna persona quiere enviarte Bitcoin, pero tú no tienes ninguna dirección, así que puedes dar este... Esta llave pública a la persona, mira muy bien, la llave pública, no la llave secreta, das a esa persona o cualquier persona y te pueden enviar un Bitcoin a esa dirección. So, remember, uh, the public key you can give to anybody. And if somebody wants to send you some Bitcoin and you, and this person doesn't have, have any, so you have already this public address where they can send you Bitcoin. <laughs> 